Hi, my name is Jo Gibson and I'm a clinical physiotherapy specialist working at the Liverpool Upper Limb Unit in Liverpool in the UK and I also work as a consultant in private practice. Um, if you've been joining us for our Monday Facebook Lives, you'll know that this is an opportunity for me to talk about all things shoulders, um, to share with you some interesting case studies, um, but also to talk about some key uh, rehab challenges and sometimes what the evidence um, might be questioning and how that what that means to our practice. However, as promised last week tonight what I thought would be to share with you another interesting case study see whether you can guess the diagnosis something a little bit different this week um, and really to share again with you some key clinical tips and tricks in terms of making a correct diagnosis what it means to our management and importantly just heighten awareness of some more unusual causes of shoulder pain so let me tell you about this patient tonight so this guy is 21. Um, he works in a call center, um, really lovely lad, um, started going to the gym, very keen to get fit, um, started um, do, trying to do things like pull-ups um, and all sorts of other things that young guys like to do in the gym. So working on the look good muscles, if you like, but was really, really struggling. And this instructor was training, uh, doing a sports uh, science degree whilst he was working in the gym. Um, and essentially, uh, it, the gym instructor said to him, you know, your, your shoulders look a bit weird. He said, your right shoulder blade isn't kind of doing the same as the left shoulder blade. And, uh, you know, perhaps you need to do some more specific work to get your shoulders strong. So they started doing some specific shoulder work. Um, and then he really started to get some kind of just general shoulder girdle aching, a bit of an ache at the back of his shoulder. And this scapular asymmetry wasn't really changing. So the guy suggested that he went to have some physiotherapy. Um, thank you to all of you that are joining me. I'm really not being rude not answering yet I'm just gonna keep waving at everybody as they join this evening it's lovely to have you all here so thank you for all your lovely comments I'll carry on with the case study and I promise I'll get to questions and things at the end um so back to our 21 year old so really nice guy as I say has a fairly sedentary job decides to go to the gym decides to do something about it and this instructor picks up this asymmetry in his scapula he can't do things like pull-ups but then he hasn't done a lot of stuff like that in the gym um but he's getting really frustrated that despite his attempts to improve he's not really seeing any significant progression and because of this um the instructor suggests he goes to see his gp now his pain is not debilitating it's just more of an annoyance um but it definitely seems to get aggravated if he does more in the gym so he goes goes to see his GP who diagnoses him with um, just subacromial pain um, tells him that he needs to go and see a physiotherapist they'll work on his scapular muscles and then everything will be fine and he'll be able to go back to the gym so he comes to see me um, and again as I say he describes kind of a bilateral aching across his shoulders um, he has got um, a little bit of soreness anteriorly, but nothing really significant. Um, and he tells me that he's really struggling to sustain his arms above shoulder height for any period of time. Um, he tried to do some DIY at home and again was struggling to hold his arms up there. He says his arms feel really heavy and it's just a massive effort to keep them up there. He doesn't describe any neurological symptoms. So when I ask him if he's got any pins and needles, any numbness, um, anything like that at all, then it's Essentially, he says, no, I haven't got any numbness. I haven't had any pins and needles. My pain is very much an ache. So there's no kind of neurogenic descriptors to his pain at all. Um, but the other thing that he says is that um, sometimes at night, um, he gets a little bit uncomfortable if he's been to the gym. But again, no significant night pain doesn't seem to relate to him lying on that side or anything else at all. Now, clearly I need to look at this guy because he's given me a history where he thinks he's developed some asymmetry in his scapula. He's struggling to keep his arms above head, um, but he hasn't got any frank neurology, okay? So all I know at the moment is he's been told he's got asymmetrical scapula, but I haven't actually looked at them. So um, guys, I'm not gonna answer if anybody gets this right or not until the end. So you're gonna have to keep building the story and see if you're right or not. So I, am, I get this guy to take his top off and I have a look at him and he, you know, looks reasonably okay. This guy seemed a bit grumpy throughout the assessment. He clearly wasn't very happy with his GP. Um, but there was just something about his kind of demeanor. He just seemed a little bit grumpy. Anyway, when I looked at him, he seemed to have some significant wasting around the shoulder girdle. So I got him, obviously, as we always do. I looked at him. I got him to do his range of movement. 
And interestingly, when he did his range of movement, he had this real um, hugely asymmetrical scapula. And we've talked about scapular dyskinesis before. But this guy had marked winging. And actually, on his right side, the scapula almost overrode his shoulder. So it kind of went up and over. So significant winging with this massive loss of control and kind of dumped his shoulders at the same time, demonstrating that he'd got marked weakness of his trapezius. Um, and he also seemed to have some wasting in the upper part of his humerus. Now, in terms of all the things that are going through my head at this time, this guy's got wasting in his trapezius. He can't lift his arms above 90 degrees. He seems to also have some issues in terms of a little bit of wasting around um, his humerus on that same side. Now, on the so this was on his right side. On the left side, he's also got some asymmetry. He's also got some winging. It's just not as severe, but there is also some um, loss of contour. Guys, you're doing great with all these suggestions coming in. I'm loving it. We're going to see who's right. Um, so again, so I, I, again, I look at him in his range of movement. He can just about get to abduction. I get him to externally rotate. His rotator cuff actually seems to be working quite well. But what's interesting when I get him in that position, you kind of see this real changing contour of his shoulder and it really shows up that he's actually got quite extensive weakness. Now, when I look at him from the front, the other really interesting thing I see is if you think of how your auxiliary folds normally look, they almost look horizontal. So he's not got any real tone in his pet major. And again, there's this kind of odd contour. So what am I thinking in my head? Well, I'm going to just tell you a few of the questions that I asked him and see whether that helps you. Okay. So you might mention that I'm, I mentioned that this guy maybe looks a little bit grumpy. So one of the things I asked him to do was, uh, well, the first question I asked him is, did he have any problems whistling, which might seem like a really weird uh, thing to ask and he said he'd never been able to whistle even since he was a kid um, I got him to do a smile um, and he kind of had more of a grin so he didn't really get that upturn um, of his mouth it was slightly asymmetrical more on one side than the other um, and I got him to kind of purse his lips so almost like doing a pout and again it was a little bit asymmetrical now you might be thinking Joe's gone a bit bonkers why is she doing that well, because there's a very definite diagnosis already going in my head purely on the basis of how it looked when he moved his shoulders. Remember, this guy's come in. He's given me this kind of, there's no real history of trauma apart from maybe doing a bit more in the gym. His symptoms aren't consistent with a tendinopathy. He's unable to sustain his arms above his head. He finds it difficult to get there and keep them there. And he's got this marked overriding scapula on one side and loss of control on the other. So I'm trying to think how much I can tell you without telling you actually what it is. Um, what was the other thing? Now, the only other thing that he'd said is he had some problems in terms of doing um, pull-ups um, and it didn't matter what they did. If they gave him a bungee cord, then that kind of made it a little bit easier. Um, but again, he was really struggling. So then one of the other things that I looked at is I looked at him in supine. I got him to lift his head up, his head and neck up, and just watched what happens to his umb umbilicus. And his umbilicus kind of moved up towards his head. And really, if your abdominals are doing their job well enough, that shouldn't happen. And that's known as the beaver sign. When I looked at this guy in standing, it was a little bit hyperlodotic. Um, and essentially, um, he had a little bit of a protruding belly, nothing that significant, but he was a fit guy, so he wasn't overweight. So guys, I'm definitely going to have to tell you in a minute because there's all sorts of fabulous suggestions coming in. Um, but sorry, Lucinda's just asked me what an overriding scapula is, and that just means that if you think of our typical winging, um, we have our serratus, medial border winging, we have our um, spinal accessory nerve trapezius winging where it tends to go more laterally. Um, but an overriding scapula is very typical of the condition that I'm just about to tell you, which is, as some of you have guessed, fascia scapula humeral dystrophy. Now, this is relatively rare. When you look at the instance rates, <laughs> anywhere between um, four and five people per 100,000, it's the second or third most common muscular dystrophy, depending on what you read. Um, so for those of you that guessed fascia scapular humeral dystrophy, well done. For those of you that didn't or don't know what it is, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, background um, so that you uh, know. So there's some very excited people now knowing that they've got the answer right. So what is is fasciocapular humeral dystrophy. Essentially, um, it's a neuromuscular disease. It is a muscular dystrophy. Um, as I say, it's relatively rare, but it is second or third most common in terms of dystrophies generally. 
what's really interesting is it quite often um, presents um, in the first in the second decade. So it's quite common that it presents in adolescence, particularly in boys. In ladies, it can present later. So I remember having a 28 year old um, who came to see me in our musculoskeletal assessment clinic because she was distressed with bilateral shoulder pain and the fact that she was losing again range above 90 degrees. And she had profound loss um, of muscle wasting. Now, the th- when if you think of fascio scapular humeral dystrophy, that kind of gives you a clue as to co- some of the common symptoms. Now, f- the facial weakness is really the most telltale sign. So if you ask patients, then often um, they'll say that they just wish they could smile. Or they haven't smiled a lot as a kid. They'll tell you they have difficulty drinking out of a straw. Um, they'll also tell you that they can't whistle. Um, and again, doing those very simple things that I talked about because it affects the muscles around the eyes and around the mouth then often doing some very simple tests can really help assess that. So in terms of looking at the eyes, um, then essentially if you get them to really try and shut their eyes quite slowly, often you'll see they can't fully shut the eyes. If you get them to really squeeze the eyes shut, they talk about this sin de cil, which is French. My French pronunciation is rubbish. So the sin de cil, uh, which is basically they can't, if you think if I really squeeze my eyes shut, I can bury my eyelashes and they can't do that. Um, sometimes patients will tell you that they've been told by a partner that they sleep with their eyes open, their eyes don't fully close, and that can make the partner feel very twitch, but it is a feature of the condition. Um, and again, you'll remember I said about this guy looking a bit grumpy. Again, like the lady that I saw, they kind of lose some of their facial expressions, so it can look very neutral, a little bit kind of... Um, expressionless I guess for want of a better description so again just something to be aware of and certainly when you look at reports from neurology centers they'll say that those telltale facial signs um, are actually usually the deal breaker in terms of making the diagnosis but again patients will sometimes say oh my family is telling me I look grumpy or tired or a little bit arrogant you know and there's but they've noticed a change in their facial expression now it's important to say that some of the facial expression changes are very very mild and some of that facial weakness is very mild. And interestingly, in terms of a neuromuscular illness, actually it is asymmetrical. So even though obviously it's a very systemically driven thing, it's an autosomal dominant gene issue, which I'll come back to in just a second. But um, the changes and the weaknesses often are asymmetrical to start with and then start to um, progress. So I'm trying not to get distracted by all these fabulous comments that are coming in that I'm looking forward to reading in just a minute. So there's about 15% of patients that actually don't only have really mild facial symptoms. So they call it facial sparing, fascio-scapular humeral dystrophy. Um, So that's, but it's something just to be aware of that you should add into your assessment. Now, the other things to continue. So we've talked about the fascial, so the facial aspects. If we talk about the scapular aspects, very commonly lower trapezius is the first muscle that's that's involved, which is again, probably why we see that overriding scapula. If you see, think of, there's nothing to resist that upward pull. Um, we then, we often then see serratus, um, so they're the most common, but it can take out the whole of trapezius as well. So again, just something to be aware of, and it's a very atypical type of, um, winging. Um, when I, when you actually look at patients, if you can get them in that 90, 90 position, they talk about this polyhill sign, which sounds a bit weird, but basically because you've got significant weakness of your traps, um, And if you like that prominent superior angle of your scapula, when you look at the contour, it looks like a series of bumps. So you've got the superior angle of the scapula because you've got that atrophy of trapezius. Um, You have the AC joint, which is the second bump because again, you get a change in contour. You usually get some wasting of the proximal deltoid, even though often deltoid function is well maintained, which gives you another little hill. And then the other muscles that get affected when we move down to the humerus um, tend to be your biceps and your triceps. Biceps, and you can get some involvement of brachioradialis as well. Now, the relative amount of weakness can vary hugely. And what's really interesting with this condition and what happened with this guy is he'd had this kind of onset and he developed some weakness, but then it kind of stopped progressing and it didn't get any worse. And depending, there's there's a type one and a type two. It just depends on the gene mutation. Type one is far more common. Um, but essentially, some patients, it can be very, very slow progressing. And some of them kind of hit a 
if you like, a plateau and don't seem to deteriorate from there. However, there's others that can then have another deterioration later on. The ones who tend to get the more severe symptoms and about 20% of patients with fascia scapulohumeral dystrophy can end up in a wheelchair are the ones that have onset of symptoms under the age of 10 and usually have quite quick progression in terms of some of those neurological um those neurological deficits if you like now sorry back to the scapula and the humerus so the other muscles that i must mention remember i said about pectoralis major so again that's another muscle that's affected in this horizontal auxiliary fold or a second auxiliary fold is another described feature of this particular condition now if you look at systematic reviews of this whilst it's called scapula uh, sorry fascia scapula humeral dystrophy there is also some evidence that patients in more severe cases can go on to develop a foot drop and have some involvement of some of the lower quadrant muscles you tibialis anterior and that foot drop is probably one of the most common um, but remember i said about this protruding abdominal uh, abdominal because of that loss of abdominal strength and therefore that hyperlordosis so there are some key features but if to be honest with this guy those features were actually very very mild now in terms of what causes this as i say generally there is a um a familial history um, and essentially 60 to 70 in t- percent of patients, there will be some family history. The lady I saw said, I'm hoping it's not the same as my cousin who's got this um, issue. Similarly, there was uh, this guy, um, He, his family, he didn't think there was any particular history. But when we kind of talked about it a little bit more, he thought that maybe he had a cousin who'd had some similar issues. And when he asked, it turned out that there was a grandparent that had the symptom as well. Now, if, you, if you've got a parent with it, then you've got a 50% chance of getting it yourself because of how that gene works. However, there is 10 to 30% of patients that will not be able to give you any family history, either because the gene um, is dormant in that family um, in terms of the parents or because it's just a new mutation so they don't have that family history it's just a weird mutation which does happen in some patients now the good news is in somebody like my guy you know often it won't progress much more significantly than that however there's a whole spectrum and in the more severe cases it's associated with fatigue chronic pain um And as I say, progressive weakness. So patients will struggle to sit up from lying. Um, They can then develop kind of hip and pelvic girdle weakness as well. So they can start to get balance issues. They can have problems with tripping because of that loss of tibialis anterior. But then again, you can see why it's really important to do a thorough assessment in terms of looking at their abdominal strength, looking at sit to stand, looking at balance and looking at those specific muscle groups in terms of weakness. So... The big problem with this is what, where does that leave us in terms of treatment? So I've got this young guy, he wants to go to the gym, he wants to get fit and healthy, what can I do? Now, when I first, my, the first patients I ever met with this were a pair of twins, and this is about 30 years ago now, in my early shoulder career, and I have to confess it was slightly kind of, oh my goodness, what are we going to do here? Because they had really profound facial features, they had really profound um, wasting around their scapula and massive functional loss. And they'd actually come to see Professor Frostick, who uh, the surgeon I was working with, um, to have scapular fusion, so uh, scapular thoracic fixation, um, which was a, which is a described operation for this group of patients if they have significant functional restriction and are really not coping. Now, there has been a Cochrane review of this and a couple of systematic reviews that suggest in the right patients, then it can increase their range of movement by about 40, 45 degrees. It improves cosmesis in terms of symptoms and it does improve the activity of daily living. However, it's not without its complications because you're wiring the scapula to the rib cage. So we get hardware failure. Um, we can get pneumothorax only in about 5% of patients. Um, but yeah, there's some. You know, it's not something to be done lightly and it's certainly not an operation that's done um commonly now in terms of other things that we can do there are some groups that have tried to look at using bracing but generally they're very poor poorly tolerated because obviously they need to impart quite a lot of force to actually give the scapula any stability but interestingly again when you look at systematic reviews in terms of whether we should do resisted exercise to target the other muscles um, or try and improve strength there's very little to guide us as clinicians and a lot of it seems to be about helping patients cope with the condition 
um, about graded um, activity and perhaps involve avoiding really intense heavy exercise because of the fear that it might have some impact on the progression or further muscle damage. But if we're honest, we really don't know. Now, for those of you that might have seen any of these patients, there is a great website, um, the Fast Show. Oh, now I can't remember it now. That's dreadful. I have written it down somewhere. I'll post the link on the Facebook page, but essentially it's a group, the Fast Show. I can't say it now. The Fascia Scapular Humor Dystrophy Group. Um, and I think it's just all, but I'll, I'll definitely put the uh, link because my brain's gone. Um, I know what it is. The Fascia Scapular Humor Dystrophy Society.org. I knew, knew that I'd get there, but it's got some fantastic resources. It talks about the different gene mutations. Um, it talks about research. Um, they're doing all sorts of fantastic work. And obviously most of the research is looking at how you can influence um, that genetic predisposition and whether you can do anything to change that and limit the amount of um, deterioration. Now, in terms of, so that was it in terms, I think somebody mentioned about treatment, but for me with this guy, it was really looking at what he had got and he still had some strength in those muscles. It was just very weak, but also looking at how he could modify what he was doing at the gym so he could still do some of the things that he wanted to do, but in a way that wasn't putting excess load on his shoulders by ignoring and working through that lack of proximal stability. So I think it's really challenging for us as um, therapists. And I guess the reason for including these people was, that you know essentially to make the diagnosis you need genetic testing unless they've got that very clear familial history and have the facial features the scapular humor features um one uh, humor feature that i missed out is that again in it depending on the severity is that you what you can see is this if you think if you've lost triceps and biceps that often the humerus can look thinner than the forearm so that very typical kind of popeye arm um is another thing just to be aware of and the lady i saw definitely um fitted those features features. So it's a really unusual condition. I've seen about six in my whole shoulder career and I'm delighted to say that four out of the six actually were relatively mild and I had to look, there was an awareness of that loss of expression but I had to look for those facial features. The two guys that had the scapular thoracic fusions had a very severe um, form of the disease and did have some deterioration. So it's an interesting condition and I hope what I've shared with you some key things to look out for in terms of um, their history, some more questions to ask, but importantly, some objective things to do to just help nail that. Now, ostensibly, they're better in the hands of a neurologist and having some genetic testing to make the diagnosis in terms of supporting their management. But at the moment, in terms of pharmacology and other things, there's actually very little to offer but actually the diagnosis is important um, and actually the genetic testing is very useful in actually highlighting how much of this particular gene mutation they have so that actually that's very helpful in terms of the likely progression of the disease. Um, so guys I'm going to come to your questions because as ever I've talked longer than I intended to let's just have a look and see so we've got lots of comments I'm just going to try and get to the top um I know there was lots of great comments coming on here and now I just need to get to the top of the page so I can see where they are. I'm so rubbish at this, guys. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, lots of people I want to say hello to who were saying hello as we went along. So thank you very much indeed. Um, so we've got can't sit to stand without help. That's so some of them can't. Remember what I said about that beaver sign where you get them lying down and lift their head and neck and if the umbilicus goes north... Um, it shouldn't do if your abdominals are working and that's your beaver sign. But yes, quite often if it's if they've got a more severe form, they will struggle to do sit stand without help. Jane, in terms of balance, absolutely, you could look at that. Stephen, I hope I've answered you. So Stephen says, what about treatment? I hope I've outlined that. Um, Nick, um, oh, here you go. So Nick... FSHD is a slowly progressive disease caused by overexpression of the DUX4 protein. 5Q34. Thank you, Nick. Obviously, an aficionado on uh, fascia scapular humor dystrophy. Thank you. I have to say, interestingly, when I look at the patients that I've seen, absolutely all the evidence is it is a, sl a slowly progressing disease. But the variation in how that progresses and when it progresses, it's important to say that it doesn't seem to have any 
impact on people's lifespan. That's really important. As I said, about 20% can end up in a wheelchair by the end age of 50. And certainly the two twins that I told you about did. Um, but this young guy, and when I look at the other people that I've seen, actually there is defo, this plateauing. And the hard thing is you don't know is when they're going to come out of that plateau and then start to progress again. The other group that's interesting, and I, I didn't see this lady, one of my colleagues was, who had... Um, who'd had problems for years and years, said that she'd never been able to drink out of a straw or whistle, but hadn't really had any significant proximal symptoms, just thought she was always a bit weak doing stuff overhead, but then um, had a baby and then had a quick progression of symptoms afterwards. So again, it's looking at triggers when they've got that um, genetic predisposition. Um, but that resource that I told you about goes into more detail about what Nick's just talking about then, about the, signi the significance in terms of the different... Um, chromosomal abnormalities and gene expression. Um, so Aaron had a patient, 21 year old, was well built in his shoulders, but absolutely no pecs bilaterally, completely flat, claimed he thought it was a slow progression. Um, it came to PT to try and improve the rounded shoulders. Does that raise any red flags? I think, to be honest, if I have anybody with wasting, particularly if it's new onset rather than something that it was they were born with, I'm definitely wanting to look at any other contributing things. So I will definitely go through that very thorough assessment um, if he's got some associated winging. Um, but again, there's lots of other weirdy, wonderful neurological things. Um, and I'll try, there's actually a link looking at differential diagnosis of those different bilateral muscle wasting so I'll try and put a link on for that for you Aaron as well um Matt really interesting excellent um, and that's for those of you who haven't heard it before that's kind of the point of doing this is if you haven't heard it before and you suddenly see somebody who's got this really weird pattern it just gives you some other things to look at and some other questions to ask to help rule this in all out and it's so important because as Stephen asked about what's the treatment the fact is, this is a, a condition that is likely to get worse over time. We don't know how much worse and we don't know how quickly it will progress. And as I say, it can be very mild in some patients. And the systematic reviews actually suggest there's a lot of people out there who never get diagnosed because the symptoms are so mild. They're just always thought to either be a bit grumpy or it's a bit weird, they can't whistle. But actually, they cope with life absolutely fine. So there is a massive spectrum. Um now, let's have a look. Uh, I've learned something new. I've learned something new. Oh, good. Good. That's great, guys. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to make sure. Can see the same in limb girdle, muscular dystrophy. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. Nick, you'd, you'd need to be uh, sharing all your expertise here about uh, fascia scapula humeral dystrophy and other dystrophies. Um, I think that's everything. I'm just going to whiz up, guys. because Oh, here you go. I've got my thing finally. I'm so rubbish with this. Right, let's have a look. Um, okay, so lots of people saying hello, hello. Lots of people. So Alex, well done. I think you were first with fascia scapula humeral dystrophy. Fantastic. Um, then we, and then it started, we had some really good suggestions about nerve palsies and stuff. Then Nick was there with fascia scapula humeral dystrophy. Nadia was there as well. Fantastic. Um, but all the things that you've talked about, Kirk, yeah, you yeah, got beaten to it, but well done, you got there. So, and lots of other great suggestions, but I hope you can see in terms of the questions that, um, sorry, Alex, there isn't a prize, but I'll have to maybe sort that out in the future. Alex is asking if there's a prize. And as Nick quite rightly says, they need to be referred for specialist um, referral because at the end of the day, um, that genetic testing is absolutely key. And there's, there's other tests you can do. Um, you can do blood tests in terms of looking at uh, serum creatinine kinase, which is indicative of muscle damage but actually not all patients will test positive on that um, and again the genetic testing is absolutely key both in terms of counselling for this guy if he decides he wants to have kids in the future um, but also to make sure they're with the right people who have the expert knowledge so Nick absolutely very important point now let's see have we got anything else uh, oh I'm rolling now I've got to the end um, no, I think that's it, guys. So thank you so much for joining again. Um, for a lot of you, it's a new condition, so that's great. Nick, it was great to have your insights as well, so thanks for joining us. Uh, um, but as I say, I cannot... <laughs> Alex, it's fine. About You're not joking about the prize. Don't worry, it's fine. Perhaps you should have one, but I'll just have to try very hard when I see somebody come up with the right answer not to tell you because I've got to keep that suspense going and keep you listening a little bit more. Um, 
So guys, I really hope you've taken some useful things away from that. Remember that uh, website, fascistscapulohumaldystrophysociety.org. Um, definitely a nice resource. has a really nice overview. Um, I'll post a link to another nice um, paper, which is Clinical Features, which summarizes a lot about what I've talked about tonight. Um, as Nick was mentioning about uh, the overexpression of certain genes, again, there's some really interesting information about that. But I think the key point from that is that these people need to be referred to to a specialist um, for that relevant testing. So guys, where does half an hour go? I fully intended to do a quick 15 minutes and here we are again. So guys, as ever, thank you so much for joining. Um, those of you who have seen these patients, I'm sure this really resonates, but again, just something, if you've got something with bilateral scapular winging, just some key things to keep in there. Thanks, Tanya, for posting the link. Um, but key things to think in terms of your differential diagnosis and making sure patients get the right support and importantly, the right counselling um, if they do in fact have this particular condition. So I've seen some fantastic uh, friends joining us tonight. So thank you all of you. Um, I'm trying very hard not to say hello to everybody and get all excited because there's some some great friends have joined us, Sabine, some great uh, experienced clinicians. So I'm very humbled that you've joined us. Um, but as I say, hope you've enjoyed it. I promise I'm going to go now. Um, uh, but look out for the links on the uh, Clinical Edge Facebook page to those uh, useful articles um, uh, just to help consolidate what we've talked about. And if you want to hear the content again, this will still be available um, on the Clinical Edge Facebook page um, and also probably released as a podcast as well. So thanks as ever, guys. Another fun Monday of Shoulder Geeking. Um, I'll be back in two weeks. So we've got a little uh, a week off next week, but I'll be back in two weeks to talk about something rehab related. An unusual condition again, but some key rehab tips and tricks. So really hope... I to see you all again then. Um, and as ever, thanks for joining. See you again soon. Bye for now. <laughs>